Three, two, one. Addicts arrives. When I arrive in his crack, crack, fat back, slap in disguise. When you reach for the door, get your access denied. I did that. One of the problems with social networking and its users is that people are unaware that the content they share may be incriminating. We have students don't even have a counselor to go to because they were laid off too. What inspires you to teach chess? What brings you out today? You're watching popping. <laughs> Hey, I'm King. And I'm Nasir. And we're your hosts today at Poppin', a youth led news show that highlights the positive things youth are doing in the city. Booyah! In this episode, we will visit some great programs and organizations, including Play on Philly, the Diamonds of Double Dutch, the Champion Chess Program, and the Philadelphia Coalition Advocating for Public Schools. We also will visit a rally for Darren Manny a high school student that was recently sexually assaulted by a police officer. To wrap up this episode, we are breaking it down where we will look at teens and social media. But first, we have this organization play on for the, let's check it out. What, what? Hey y'all, it's Poppin', I'm Tiffany. And I'm Terrence. Right now we're located at Free Airy Charter Middle School. We're about to go check out an after school program called Play on Philly. It teaches young kids how to play different types of instruments and everything about music. So let's go check it out. One, two, three, four. Two, three, four. Can you tell me a little about the program that you're in? It's really fun. Uh, playing an instrument is really fun. I like that we can like play an orchestra and learn about like different instruments and learn to play our own instrument. I'm the communications manager here at Play on Philly, otherwise known as POP. POP serves um, children who might not otherwise have the opportunity to take music lessons. Um, we serve over 200 students at the two sites and they study music uh, instrumental lessons, choir, composition, theory, ensemble, orchestra, um, for up to three hours every single day after school. They get to, you know, play trombone or whatever on other instrument. Um, it's really actually a lot of fun to help them with their homework, just see the kids, you know, kind of develop and grow as a musician, but also as people too. Some part of the um, program is really challenging, and most of the part, I just like being in this program because it also helps me with my schoolwork. Do you know any songs by heart? It is an intensive program, so they're coming every single day throughout the school year and studying music up to three hours. So um, that's the equivalent of up to 15 private music lessons a week. Music moves forward in time, right? But it doesn't go into the future that far, okay? So, we go from the edge of the page. I really would love for them to come to an understanding that uh, pursuing excellence is a process and that it's not there's no end to it. It's just getting them, getting them in the habit of trying to do one thing at a time really well. And, and taking, having a bit of pride about like doing that one thing really well. That's great, like Frostic Flakes. Yeah, but for real. We need schools that have programs that are fun and educational like that. True, but that's not happening. What? You forgot already. School funding is getting cut. Man, what? We need to protest. And PCAPS is leading the way. Oh, yup. Yeah. They just... They... Don't tell them. Let them watch and find out. Education is under attack! What do we do?
Right now, y'all here with Saeed from Poppin, and right now I'm here with the coalition coordinator for PCAPS, which is the Philadelphia Coalition Advocating for Public Schools. Uh, we're a coalition of labor unions, community organizations, parents, students that have come together to stand up for our public schools, especially in the time right now where we see our schools under attack. We want to make sure that we get the proper resources to make sure that every child gets a great education. My story is just one of many as we see these massive cuts and disinvestment in our city's youth. As teachers are let go and classes are growing, all our children are taking notice that much of their success or failure lies in how the adults decide to fix the funding issues we are facing. What's one of the core messages you was getting across today? Uh, the core message is that we need to make sure that our schools have the resources that they need um, financially and we can't keep giving away taxes, tax giveaways to rich developers at the expense of starving our schools. What does it really mean to say the 20 buildings keep almost $15 million from the schools each year? Or that this building we're standing in front of right now gets an abatement for almost all of its value, which costs the schools over $1 million? What does it really mean to say that these losses in revenue could fund 446 counselors, for example, for our schools? A lot of things happening in our school district, in our schools, where a lot of, a lot of things are getting cut, like our nurses, uh, extracurricular activities and like more things that shouldn't be cut. Break our librarians back and open libraries that have been shut down. Our counselors who got us through our roadblocks and life during school and the everyday staff who keeps us safe. In certain schools like they don't even have their kitchen open, they don't have no counselors, no librarians and people be really going through stuff when they go to school so it's like we don't got the proper resources that we need so this was just to let them know like we continue on like we're gonna continue on protesting like we're really not gonna stop till we get the funding that we need. that they live in a city and attend a school district that does not provide for their success, but instead is banking on their failure. The parents are fed up with our children serving as collateral damage. We're fed up with our communities being marginalized. My life after the budget cuts has left me to find somewhere to sit because we have a total of 36 students in my classroom. We don't have enough teachers to help us out because they were either they were either laid off or didn't return. Do you think this is fair? No. We as students don't even have a counselor to go to because they were laid off too. Now we have to deal with our problems on our own. It is not right for us to be struggling while we have wealthy corporations not lacking any financial resources receive a 10-year tax break. Break our librarians back and open libraries that have been shut down. Our counselors who got us through our roadblocks and life during school and the everyday staff who keeps us safe needs to be reinstated. I'm Sierra Maletti and I'm scared of the budget cuts. Please pay your fair shares. <laughs> That's crazy that these rich developers receive $15 million in tax cuts and our schools can't afford basic resources. That's so true. And that's why we need y'all viewers to join in this movement to solve this problem. There are organizations that do positive things to help fight school closings and budget cuts. If you would like to get involved, check out PCAPS. P-C-A-P-S. <laughs> PCAPS. Up next, we are going to the Linfest Center to meet a champion chess team in the Diamonds of Double Dutch. Hey y'all, it's Jaja from Poppin, and I'm here with the Poppin crew. And today we're back at the Linfest Center to interview a chess team and their director. And let's go check it out. Poppin! <laughs> <laughs> I'm here with Mr. Gill. And Mr. Gill is the director of the chess team here at the Linfest Center. Mr. Gill, what inspires you to teach chess? Well, I was, when I started teaching chess, it was about 20 years ago. But what made me start in the community, in the neighborhood, 
was that I was told that the students weren't smart enough to learn this. They didn't have the patience. They weren't interested in critical thinking and, and anything that might want to help them with their education. So I started teaching them chess to make them slow down and think. And um, we've been having success. So I hear you won the state champions. How do that feel? Pretty awesome. My first time going to the States, I lost all my games. So I just looked at it, looked at it as though when, next time I go, I'm just going to win all the games I play. And I succeeded. How do you feel when you lose a game? Well, the only time I get mad when I lose a game is when I don't realize what I did wrong. When I realize what I did, what I did wrong, I know I didn't really lose. I just made a mistake. And then I can fix, I can fix it next time. What expectations do you have for your students? For them to succeed in life. Chess is about making the right decisions. So in my life, I got to make the right, right decisions to succeed. The chess is a tool uh, to sit down, to think, think before you open your mouth, think before you make a move. And this is something that is lacking. Our children don't think before they react and think before they do anything. Chess will help you do that. How did you get involved with the chess club? When I moved to North Philadelphia and I attended Steel Elementary, I wasn't sure what to do actually. I wasn't um, smart enough to pick my battles or to um, be academically smart as um, everybody else in my class. But then I met this man, Mr. Gill, who I could say he's one of the main catalysts in my life. He didn't only teach me how to play chess, he taught me how to um, think things through to be a smarter person within myself. I started playing when I was in fifth grade. I went to summer camp and I met Mr. Gill and he had these summer tournaments and he turned me out to play. And then after, ever since then, i just been playing. My favorite subject is math. And on the chessboard, you add and subtract. And all I do with math is add and subtract. I'm the best at it. I got involved with the chess team because I love the games, also the battles. Also, I could study moves of my opponent. Hey, I'll put that in my I got involved in chess because it helps you learn a lot and solve problems in life. I got involved because um my grades were kind of low last year. When I met Mr. Gill, my grades went up. Never give up. I don't never quit. Because when you quit, I mean like you're quitting on life. What's the point of playing if you're going to quit? We're here Monday, Wednesdays, and Fridays. From 5 to 7 and on Fridays, we're here from 4 to 6. Or 4 until closing. How can other, how can other students get involved? Just come here to the Memphis Center. Hey, I'm King. I'm Tiffany. And I'm Nasir. And you're watching Poppin'. Right now, we're in North Philly at the Lymphest Center covering an awesome program called the Diamonds of Double Dutch. They're really awesome, they're really dope, and I want to find out more, so let's go check it out. Hey, y'all, it's Poppin'. I'm Tiffany. I'm Naja. Okay, Naja, so um, can you tell me a little bit about the program you're in, Diamonds of Double Dutch? Uh, Diamonds of Double Dutch is a program that Coach Coffee do, and she teaches us how to jump competitive double dutch. Our mission at Diamonds of Double Dutch is to reinfuse something that was culturally a part of the community, which is now null and void. So I'm the state representative for the state of Pennsylvania in the American Double Dutch League, and our goal is to form teams throughout the state of Pennsylvania and have them compete in the World Invitational, which is held in South Carolina every summer. <laughs> So, why did you come here? What, what drew you towards the Diamonds of Double Dutch? Because I knew everybody from around the neighborhood and everybody was doing Double Dutch. What made you want to come here? Why were you interested? Well, because um, she brought a little team here and then they started jumping and stuff. And then they was doing like kind of flips. Miss Michelle, she like, Coach Coffee, she really like helped us. 
jumping and like they I like my teammates because they always help me like get my form together and all that. Side to side. Nope. Put it one hand. The girls used to jump double dutch in the street. They don't jump double dutch as much as they used to anymore. I think the videos and video games have pretty much taken a role in them participating. So with that, our kids have become more obese. What I found is there's a void in Double Dutch in the urban community. So I formed the organization so that we could reinfuse something that was culturally a part of our community long before, but now we're infusing it, not only just to instill the culture of Double Dutch, but to get the kids competing into Double Dutch competitions. Oh, it was fun, man. I didn't know you could jump like that. Yeah, but you missed the chess thing. So you know some kid beat me in three moves? For real? For real. That's crazy. That's how you know they're really teaching them kids something up there. Now, up next, we will turn to a rally for Darren Manning, the high school student that was sexually assaulted by a Philadelphia police officer. Mark here from Poppin on the frosty and frigid corner of Broad and Girard, where a protest is about to commence uh, concerning Darren Manning, a child who was sexually harassed and assaulted by a police officer on his way home from school. And let's check it out and let's see what's going on. Uh, Sean Wayne, can you tell me a little bit about what's going on today? Well, basically, we're out here today having a little rally and for Darren Manning um, for the situation that he endured um, last week um, where he may be sterile for the rest of his life. Uh, we don't think that was right and we want justice done for that. Why did you come to Darren Manning's rally today? I heard that a member of my community, uh, just a few blocks from where I live, was sexually assaulted by an employee of the Philadelphia Police Department, and that concerns me a great deal. So, Drew Brown, what brings you out today? I'm a resident of this area, I work and go to school in this area, and this is an event that happened to someone that looks like me or looked like me 15 years ago, or looks like my children. And so, in that case, I have to come down here. If not for Darren, um, if not for Darren Manning, I definitely should be down here for my sons and, uh, and the sons of all um, black and brown people that are being profiled in this area. Jamal, can you tell me a little bit about um, what you know about Stop and Frisk? From what I know, Stop and Frisk gives police the right to stop anyone without possible cause or any real suspicion just because they might feel a person might look a certain type of way or feel as though maybe a person black, they shouldn't be in this type of neighborhood, so let me see what they up to, you know, things like that. No justice, no peace, no racist police. So how do you feel um, is the current state of the, uh, the relationship between uh, law enforcement and the community, particularly law enforcement and young black men? I think the cops, I mean, they, they, they earn the reputation that they got for being the way that they are. Like, cops in Philly is dirty. Like, they, not all of them, but a lot of them really just don't care about the youth and they really just got a chip on their shoulder. And then, you know what I mean, as far as the youth go and the community, uh, growing up, we're taught to have this outlook as like the police just want to lock us up or whatever. So on both hands, it's a bit of a misunderstanding. What do you hope to get out of this event? I hope that people will come together and recognize that police abuse is a serious problem, not just in Philadelphia, but around the country. And it requires a community solution that's peace focused. And that's what I see here today, so I'm very happy. Um, I think that every time we get a chance to lift our voices, we definitely should. I'm just one person, so one person's not going to do it. It takes a whole village to raise one child, so we're going to need the whole city of Philadelphia to come out and get together. Man, that was crazy. Have you ever been harassed by the police? Yes, a couple of times. Because they thought we was flash bombers, me and my brothers. We was just walking in the park, and it was a fight up the street. And they must have thought we was a part of it because we're black. And our skin color, I don't know, really. 
That's so ridiculous, kinda confusing. man. That's it crazy, is. though. That ties right in with the Darren Manning case. I'm glad that the people of the community aren't just standing by and actually taking part in stopping police brutality. Up next, we're going to break it down to tell us the do's and don'ts of social media. Hey, I'm Terrence Lewis. I'm Tiffany Hall. And you're, and you're watching, watching Breaking It, it down. down. Break it, break it down. Break it down, break it down, break it down. Break it down. <laughs> Here at Breaking It Down, we analyze social issues in our society that affect you. Today, we're going to focus on things you should know when using social media. We'll focus on these three topics, digital footprints, privacy settings, and how teens use social media in empowering ways. According to the independent research firm Next Advisor, 9 out of 10 teens use social media today. 57 million teenagers use Facebook and 102 million teens use Twitter. As more and more people use social media, the use of social networks such as Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram dominate social interactions. So are we mindful of everything we do online? Are we aware of our digital footprint? Digital footprints are like the impressions we leave behind in the digital world, which includes the use of TVs, mobile phones, the internet, and other connected devices. So what we clicked on, what we are tagged in, what we searched for, websites we visit, our location, what we said, and what is said about us, all of these things make up our digital footprint. We need to be aware of how we present ourselves online and who's watching. A common myth is that once you delete something off the net, that is truly gone. But all it takes is a screenshot to immortalize a tweet, a post, an image, or a video. One of the problems with social networking and its users is that people are unaware that the content they share may be incriminating. This content can range from images of minors consuming alcohol, people taking illegal drugs, sexually suggestive images of minors, and cyberbullying. Some of the consequences for sharing this kind of content online is not a good look. Even if you think it doesn't affect you now, it could potentially affect you down the line. For example, your digital footprint can affect your educational and professional opportunities now or in the future. Research shows that a lot of college admissions officers Google college applicants and check out their social media profiles to evaluate their character. Some students create fake names on social media to get around this, but schools aren't the only ones checking profiles. 91% of employers view the social lives of employees and applicants, and 69% of employees have rejected applicants based on what they have found online. Some social networks like Facebook and Twitter have come under fire for sharing the personal information of their users with advertisers. Social networks have also collaborated with law enforcement to monitor criminal activity. The good news is that we do have control over what we decide to put online in the first place. So how much information is too much? Well, 71% of teens display their school names. 71% display their home address. And 20% post their cell phone numbers. According to research, only 60% of teens set their profiles to private. Sharing personal information is up to you, but know that not everything is meant to be shared with everybody. Hackers and predators do not have your best interests in mind. So at the very least, we should know how to use privacy settings. So now that we've addressed why it's important to be aware of our digital footprints and privacy settings, let's talk about how young people can and are using social medias in healthy and empowering ways. That's right, young people are using social media to express creativity, empower themselves and their communities. For example, youth on Instagram and Twitter use their profiles to advocate for missing children. Young Philly entrepreneurs like designer Karan J are using social media to grow and market their business. Organizations like Youth United for Change and Hutos have young people using social media to spread the word about organizing around school funding and deportations. Even here at Poppin, we use social media to connect to our viewers when we highlight the positive things that youth are doing in Philly. So obviously there's more to social media than hunting for your 16th light, trying to be someone's Man Crush Monday or Woman Crush Wednesday, or showing how you transformed on a Tuesday. That concludes our segment around teens, social media, and our digital footprint. So once again, I'm Terrence Lewis. I'm Tiffany Hall. And we just, just broke it down. Break 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 it down. <laughs> well, I guess I got to check my Facebook privacy settings. Me too. And that wraps up our episode for today. I'm your host, Nasir Mackball. And I'm King. Remember to like us on Facebook. Facebook. Follow us on Instagram, Instagram and Twitter. Twitter. Subscribe to our YouTube channel. channel. And you're watching 
popping. That was crazy. I feel you, man. <laughs> <laughs> He's staring deep into my eyes.